Ah, buenos días. Pues gracias por estar aquí. Voy a bajar aquí. Uh, uh. ¿Cómo le bajo el volumen? Así. Ah, gracias por estar aquí en el coloquio extraordinario. Tenemos aquí el placer de... Perdón, es que hay eco y no puedo hablar con eco. Nos visita a Federico Vincentelli. Él ahora es postdoctorado, está haciendo un postdoctorado en el Instituto de Astronomía de Canarias. Hizo su doctorado en la Universidad de Insubria. Después hizo una estancia postdoctoral en Southampton de tres años y estuvo un año en la Universidad de Filadelfia, en Filadelfia, perdón, en la Universidad de Vilanova. Ok, denos un minuto, tenemos aquí unos problemillas técnicos. ¿Ahora sí? Ok, muy bien. No. ¿Ahora? A ver. Ahora sí, es que muy, se distrae uno mucho, ¿no? escuchando el eco. Ah, bueno. Adelante, Federico. Thank you very much um, for having me here to give this talk. So today I will give a, bro a broad overview on fast viability across the magnetic spectrum from Loma 6-ray binaries. Uh, the reason is this is because this is um, one of the main drivers that um, brought to the development of Opticam, which is now, as we know, built on San Pedro Martir in a two-meter telescope. And so given that I have been working on this subject for many years since my PhD, um, I thought to give an overview on What we have done in the last years, this is a very recent and say, new uh, field and very exciting with very nice results. And so just to give you a review on what we can do with this um, kind of techniques and, for, and especially with Opticam. So uh, when we talk about Loma 6 3 binaries, we're talking about accreting systems. Um, accretion is one of the most important phenomena in astrophysics because we know It's responsible for the for the for for the emission of, of uh, many high energy objects. Uh, it's a fundamental process for black holes, and of, and therefore it also as the as a critical black holes we also create jets. Ah, okay. <laughs> and um, so uh, so it creates jets that so creates feedback, and so it's in. Um, And so it's important for the story, for the history of the universe itself. However, we have still many uh, questions that we don't know. We don't know uh, what is the geometry of the accretion flow, how it evolves with, uh, with accretion rate. We don't know um, how jets are formed. We don't know the physical properties inside jets. And therefore, in order to understand these objects, to, to, understand, to, under, to answer, answer these questions that are important for, as I said, for many reasons, we have to go and look at accreting systems. Uh, the main, say, high energy heating systems that we know are, are the, say, these ones, supermassive black holes, star massive black holes, and natural stars. And um, uh, today we'll focus on uh, each pro each of these objects have a different property that can be useful for different things, depending on what you want to study. Today we'll talk about Loma 6 3 binaries, which are my favorite ones because they are very bright and, uh, so, and, um, and they have frequent outbursts, so it's... Uh, They are useful. So, um, Loma 6 ray binaries are, um, I don't know why it's cut here, but okay. Um, uh, Loma 6 ray binaries is, um, are, say, transient systems which uh, are found in our galaxy and um, uh, are formed by a, uh, a natural star or a stellar mass black hole, which is creating mass from uh, a Loma star. And as you can see here from this long term light curve, they are. Um, Say uh, transient, they spend most of, most of their time in quiescence and they undergo this uh, phase of activity that we call outburst, where the luminosity uh, increases quite a lot. And they also have a very broad, um, let's say, spectral energy distribution. We have, um, I don't understand if the people online see what we are seeing here or not. This one here, or what I see here? What I see in my computer. Okay. Um, 
because yeah, bro, here's crap. But anyway, here you have a, a very broad SCD. Um, here you have uh, optical infrared radio. You also have the uh, emission in, in X-rays down here, and uh, and this is due to the fact that there are multiple emission emitting components. Um, and so in order to understand how they behave, we have to understand what are all these, uh, how all these components are, which are these components. So the first one is the so-called, uh, I say, this is the accretion disk, which here is cut, but it's here, and it's hidden. There's, some, I don't know if, I don't want to make a mess. There's a way to, anyway. Uh, so it's the accretion flow, um, which uh, is emits mainly in X-rays to so the conversion of um, um, so accretion potential into electromagnetic energy, and uh, we have mainly two components in the accretion flow. We have this is the X-ray spectrum that we see, and we know that this component evolves with time during the outburst. We have sometimes a, a thermal spectrum, which is which is. Um, coming from the multicolor uh, black body of the, of the disk. But we also have a harder component, which is due to Crompton, inverse Crompton uh, scattering from a hot cloud in the inner regions of the system. And, um, and so we have, as, 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 as you can see here, these two components. And um, the interesting thing that, that would be important later is that, um, the, that we know that uh, the hot inflow um, can actually, so this, uh, the the component um, the component responsible for the hard X rays can also, in certain under certain condition, go go and emit synchrotron radiation at optical infrared wavelengths if it's big enough, and we are seeing this uh, more often. And I will show you some evidence later. So um, the other component that we can observe is irradiation from the other parts of the disk and the star, which is that part here, and it emits through, uh, so it's thermal uh, radiation uh, and it's uh, uh, peaking usually in optical infrared wavelengths. And we see it very well when we go and see um, type 1 X-ray bursts, which are, let's say, flashes of um, of a nuclear, thermonuclear explosion on the surface of an neutral star, very, very intense, that illuminate all the system, and we see the optical counterpart. This is an X-ray burst in X-rays, and we see an optical infrared counterpart delayed. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to fix something uh, here on the, because we're, from here live we cannot see part of the screen. Now it works, All right? Perfect. So um, you can see here that I was saying these are type one X-ray bursts, which are a phenomenon that are seen in a creating neutron star. And it's uh, when you're creating too much, the, the, the uh, you can in, uh, ignite some uh, thermal nuclear reactions that uh, 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 do this X-ray flash, and we see this flash of X-rays illuminating the rest of the system. Um, with an optical infrared delay, with an optical infrared burst, but with a delay, which is due to the fact that you have some light travel time that the light takes time to illuminate the system. And this can be used, uh, for example, to um, to constrain the, the system parameter. Um, the, the last component, which is one of the other most important, is, as I said, at the beginning, jets. We don't know, we don't only have Accretion, we also have outflowing matter. And uh, we see in these systems, especially when we have that the hard component that I was telling you uh, before, a, um, a a compact jet. Uh, and we see it uh, because we see a um, radio emission with a flat spectrum, which extends up to, up, up to optical infrared wavelengths. And this is because uh, as matter is launched into the jet, um, it will be synchrotron radiation, and as we far as we go further downstream, the synchrotron peak will go at longer wavelengths, and therefore we will have a superposition of different synchrotron emission profiles that gives you us this flat spectrum. Um, 
So as I as I already as I, I explained to you, uh, all these components have um, some contribution at optical infrared wavelengths, and therefore, in order to understand um, to understand the fundamental questions I was talking, I was telling you before. So um, understand the geometry, understand the physical properties. We have to understand what is happening at optical infrared wavelengths. We have to, we have to be able to decompose the different uh, contributions in this regime. And this cannot be done only with spectral analysis because it's uh, highly degenerate. We need something else. What is this something else? Variability. Because luckily enough, these systems have this magnificent property that they are very, very variable on short timescales. They don't have only the, um, say, frequent outbursts, but if we go and look at them for a couple of hours, we can see, we can measure these amazing light curves with high time resolution at all wavelengths from X-rays to optical infrared, and also now we see it in radio, and I'll show you later. And this is an example of a light curve of yeah, 1,000 1, seconds at the time of this uh, seminar, and you see how variable it is in both X-rays and infrared, and you have variability that goes down to um, sub-second time scales, so very fast. And therefore, we, with this variability, we can probe the innermost regions of, of the systems and understand what is... Um, how how the geometry, uh, what is the geometry, what are the physical processes? The main tool that we use is therefore uh, say time series analysis, standard time series analysis. The thing I will show you today mainly is uh, uh, cross cross correlation functions, um, which is simply the measure of the correlation correlation between two components between two time series as a function of the shift between the two, and therefore this can be done to understand if there is a delay, if they are correlated, and if there is a delay, for instance. If there is a mirror at a certain shift, the cross correlation function will of between the the original and the reflected one will have a peak at the shift at the delay of the shift. And um, but we can also with this merge with this um, method we can also infer if there uh, if there is a more complex uh, behavior or connection between two components. I will show you later. So. Um, one of the biggest results with this method is the measure is the measurement of a 0.1 second lag between X-ray and optical infrared emission. This is the most famous most, most famous examples uh, of the famous black hole GX to Cinemas 4, which is a, a famous because it goes in outburst many times. And um, we measure if we do, uh, it has not been measured many times um, a lag. A peak of the uh, a lag of between X-ray and infrared, an optical infrared wavelengths of 0.1 second lag, 100 milliseconds, and this can be explained um, cannot be explained with uh, thermal reprocessing because it's too short and the variability is too fast. The only thing that can explain this, given that we know that there is optical infrared emission from the jet, is that the jet is emitting uh, this su such variable emission, and actually this led. Um, so what is what is happening is something like that, where we we have uh, fluctuations in the infra in the X-rays from the inner flow that are traveling in the jet and are emitted uh, as synchronous radiation. And in order to emit such fast variability, we need the presence of shocks inside the jet. This is a say well-known scenario for for GRBs. And uh, this the very interesting thing is that this method allowed us to develop an internal shock model for Roma six advantage as well. So not as fast as GRBs, but this can. Uh, this is an example of uh, synthetic light curves that these models can do. These are modeled by uh, by Julian Malzac, and this is a, uh, an example of the CCF that you can uh, obtain um, from the from the from from the theory. So this is really similar to what we observe. So and thanks to this, we can now we have constrained uh, the speed of the jet, the um, the energetics of the jet. Uh, the launching radius of the jet, so things that we cannot do only with radio because radio is uh, too far away. So this is something open a new, completely new field to to study jets. And these are, are just our, um, other examples of um, what we, of what we can do of of uh, of, of the other uh, um, um, these are just an example of of, of the other. Um, um, cross correlation functions that we have measured in other systems. So this is the famous C404 Cygni, Max 1820, 4 u 1543 and this is a very recent outburst that we uh, of a new black hole, very bright, and we can see that this is, these systems are showing always a 0.1 second lag. So we are seeing 
uh, we are starting to build statistics to to see that all jets actually behave or seem to to behave in the same way in in uh, in this system. So, likely with more, some more time, we will be able to understand. Uh, we will be able to do a, a proper statistical analysis of these systems and understand um, understand more about about these jets. Um, however, uh, there's a big however um, because we see actually that. Uh, we don't see always this behavior. If this was only, if we only saw the point of particular, it would be way easier. We actually see some. We have seen a way more complex phenomenology if we if we can observe these systems. Um, uh, we see we sometimes we see different cross correlation functions, which means that there is not only the jet. There are also different components that are that there are different components that we were talking about before actually are playing a role. Um, you can see here that we have. Uh, actually, anti-correlations sometimes. So it means that the, uh, when the X-ray uh, rises, the optical goes down. We see very long responses. You can see here optical, say here, few seconds, time, time seconds delays. You see actually here that the infrared. This is not published. This is something I'm working on recent now. It's not published yet. You see that the infrared sometimes comes before, and you see these very complex cross-correlation functions. And uh, the big problem is that uh, we don't really understand very well why this is happening. There's only one model that can explain more or less broadly this kind of complex behavior, which is the hot inflow model, which I was telling you before. As you can see, um, so as I told you, um, um, this model explains, um, the, um, invokes that the, if the hot inflow is big enough, it can emit synchrotron radiation from the outer part. And it's, if it's big enough, the synchrotron radiation comes, uh, uh, reaches the optical infrared regime. And if you then, um, uh, this model also um, implies that the X-ray comes from the synchrotron self Compton radiation of, of this, of, 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 of the synchrotron photons with the same energy. And therefore there is an anti-relation because if, if you have the same population of electrons and one that produces electrons in opt in a synchrotron in, in synchrotron radiation in optical and the other and the X-rays are self synchrotron Compton, the energy budget is similar, and so there must be an anticorrelation. So this generates an anticorrelation, and therefore this this model, in order to accommodate the complex shape, it, it just assumes that there's also um, reprocessing component, and therefore playing with these two pro these two components, we can just create the, the wonderful and complicated CCF that we observed before. However, the main problem of this, of this model is that it has many parameters and it's not clear when actually this model, uh, say, dominates over the jet. So, uh, and this is actually something that we have to understand ourselves because we don't know exactly in at which phases of the outburst we see this complex CCF rather than the jet. So this is something, for instance, that we really hope to that Optican can give a, a great contribution because um, if you observe, the only way to actually solve this problem is to observe more and more systems and especially bright systems that are often in, uh, say, in the opt in the say part of the sky that can be observed with Optican. And so with Optican, that given that we can go very fast, we will be able to um, to probably understand better build a proper sample and understand better what is going on. Um, so in the last, uh, say, few 10 minutes, five minutes, I want to then explain to you um, what are the next steps for um, for this kind of, uh, um, for this kind of studies. So the first, st the first step, uh, I think, is to extend not only uh, X-ray to X, let's say this multivalent approach between X-rays and optical infrared, we have to extend it also to longer wavelengths, so submillimeter radio. And this is something that has been done recently. This is a work by Alex Sedarenko. Uh, you need very bright systems to do it. So this is the famous Max CH 1820. And you can see that thanks to the coordination of many um, astronomers, we managed to get these wonderful campaign where we have from X-rays, um, optical, infrared, submillimeter ALMA, VLA, and all VLA with time resolution. 
high, it was a relatively high time resolution. And thanks to this, we could, for example, measure um, the amplitude of the, of the variability as a function of the Fourier frequency, so the say the power spectrum. And um, and this means that, and we can see that as we go at longer wavelengths, we are going with um, with the amplitude goes down, which this is expected because we, as I as I said before, we are way up in the jet in the radio, and therefore we have less variability. But the very cool thing is that this actually can be tested with models because the internal shock model can predict this. We can actually um, compute the expected variability at all wavelengths with these models. And therefore this was a very, very powerful constraint on um, on, on jets. We can constrain the, the structure all along the jet and we can constrain, for example, the very well the, the velocity and the, and the, and the launching radius. Um, the other thing that uh, I'm actually more active on this is to extend this kind of approach to neutron stars. So um, the reason is because neutron stars uh, are not black holes, and so they they have a surface and not a event horizon. So comparing black holes and neutron stars can be very useful to understand what are the how the properties of the jet depend on on let's say on the um, only on the disk or on the spin or the magnetic field. So, um, I'm, however, the other stars are fainter. I can show you at the beginning. Um, here you can see that natural stars are way fainter than black holes, especially in radio and optical infrared. So it's way com more complicated to do it. Uh, but if we manage to get some some data on these natural cells, we can actually start to understand better what is going on uh, with these jets, understand better the launching mechanism. So uh, this is a, and this is an example that I want to show you. Let's say the, one of the best example that uh, I have recently published on uh, on Nature, where um, this is a um, campaign, as you can see, another very impressive campaign with X-ray, UV, with HST, optical with Liverpool telescope, um, infrared with VLT, and um, radio with uh, VLA. And you can see that this this is a neutron star, is um, which is, which was uh, very high, quite high luminosity. And this neutron star actually um, is flaring a lot. And this flaring is not common in low mass X-ray binaries. And so um, I, I took this data in 20, we took this data in 2019. And I remember working on this project for like uh, two years and staring at this light curve and trying to understand how to do it. And then when I went to Philadelphia, uh, which was uh, working with Joe Nielsen, uh, who is an expert on uh, black hole variability, we realized actually by, by looking especially at the infrared light curve, which is the best sample data, that the infrared behavior of this neutron star is very, very similar to the behavior of a um, uh, of, a, of a famous black hole, which is GS2015. This black hole is famous because we know that this system undergoes a so-called accretion instability, which is a, uh, an instability in which the system starts to uh, um, destroy and rebuild the the, the, um, the disk on short time scales because we are going, we are we are reaching the um, Eddington luminosity, or very close to the Eddington luminosity. And the fact that we see a very similar light curve in infrared is telling us that the, the same process must be happening in, 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 the, in this natural star as well. And this was never been observed before. And um, because we were lacking uh, of the data, and also because, we, because as you can see here, we need a very long baseline to do this. And the very interesting thing is that this um, this process is, is confirmed on a multi-wavelength context. If you look at the radio light curve, for instance, we see, so we know that 1915 here on the right, forget this part on the left for a moment, we, kn we knew that 1915 was showing these radio oscillations on long time scales, which were due to the fact that the disk is, that the disk, that the jet is launching uh, blobs cyclically, and this is happening at the transition between these stable and unstable phase. This was known. For the first time we could do this, try to, to model this, uh, apply this model also to a neutron star as well. 
And we see that we are seeing the same exact phenomenon also in an electro star. And this means therefore that this accretion instability that was, was, that was seen only in black holes is actually possible also in neutral star. And therefore it's a, it's a, this is a phenomenon that does not depend on the central object. It's a intrinsic property of the disk only. Um, so, and for, and to, and this is like the, the, the say the summary slide of, of, of this work is that so on the top, so this is so what we are see what we are what we saw actually is something like this. We have a crucial rate as a function of time, and the system undergoes this uh, instability where the jet happens at the transition. And depending if the repro if the reprocessing or the jet dominates, we see different uh, behavior in natural stars or black or, or black holes. Um, I, I didn't. I thought I didn't have enough time, so I didn't put enough an, a lot of material on this. But if you want, I have other slides we can we can show. Um, so these were my, actually my summary slide. Um, but if you have questions on the on this last project, I have other slides. So I hope to, that I convinced you that um, low mass the binaries are ideal laboratories to study, um, let's say, um, physical processes regarding accretion. Um, and that uh, how I explained to you how fast variability is really important to try to understand um, the geometry and the physical processes of these systems. Um, I also showed you how nowadays we are actually the, we are managing not only to get wonderful data in, in optical infrared, but we are also managing to extend this powerful approach at longer wavelengths, which is allowing us to study the jet, the whole structure of the jet. And also how now we are also managing to get very uh, impressive data sets on natural stars, which uh, with time will allow us to understand better what are the say um, intrinsic properties of um, of jets, regardless of uh, the presence of black hole or natural stars. Thank you very much. Do you prefer English or Spanish? English? Okay. Are you have questions here? It's okay. Well, okay. So, thanks for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, maybe I lost something part of uh, your presentation, but I have um, the question about the first why you interpreted such variability as evidence of a jet. Maybe you told about this, but could you repeat? Uh, which one? Which variability? Uh, you, you the last what, one? Uh, or? Yes, for example, this variability is uh, the presence of a jet. No, so, so, no, so this is not, sorry, this I will not explain it very well. So this is not presence of the jet. This is due to reprocessing. So they, they have, so this is, this is a very particular case because as, as I said, this behavior is not common at all. So, but this is not, and, and this, does not come from the jet. So, uh, and actually in my work, I demonstrated that this comes from reprocessing from the other part of the accretion disk. Yes, and, yes, and my second uh, question or second comment uh, related to about neutron stars and black holes, uh, because you show the same variability in uh, for neutron stars and black holes, it's yeah. uh, very normal because in general, only internal part of the disk will be different in case of this uh, compact object. But the uh, rest of the disk will be related with uh, physics of the disk, nothing more. Uh, only uh, the difference between neutron star and uh, the black hole, uh, the size and the presence or absence of the uh, magnetic field from one side and the solid surface. Because yes, black but hole has also... And, uh, and temp temperature, a few yes. different uh, yes. temperature inside of the uh, accretion disk. But this is uh, this radiation go out at the high uh, energy, not at the infrared and uh, X-ray, because this is infrared and X-ray related with the rest of the disk. Yes, uh, I, I agree. But uh, it, I, the thing is that, with as you said, like, yeah, it, it depends on the magnetic field, on the on if you have boundary layer, etc. But it also depends 
So in, instead, if you have a mandatory layer rather or a, or a strong mandatory field, you will also have different processes. You will have different more contribution from synchrotron radiation in the disk rather than from the jet. And so it's not obvious that it's exactly the same across the, the variability on short time is, is, is actually the same. So in this case, uh, this was not, um, I mean, for this case in particular, um, the, the problem is that um, in order to have, so uh, so this was not, so this process was never invoked for neutron stars. This uh, accretion instability that has been seen in uh, black holes has, has never been uh, invoked for neutron stars. And actually this work shows that actually there is this process. And actually it tells us that a lot of classes of systems which are called um, a, a bigger class, which is, which is um, the Z sources actually seem to show this radiation pressure instability all the time. So it's, uh, I agree with you. And, but the, the thing is that not always you see the same, like the, the, if you have a, a bundle layer or not, will change a little bit the phenomenology. Maurice. Do you remember the wavelength of the infrared uh, observations, the light curves there? Um, two microns. Okay. K band. Thank you for the presentation. So, could you please expand a bit about uh, on the on the radio emission that you observe? I think at the beginning you showed the um, multi wavelength spectrum. So, so. Could you could you please tell us uh, where where exactly it's seen from the radio? It's from the jet, the, this one. So what, but the radio we associate the radio always to the jet. Um, the in low mass X three binaries it can be compact, so like more like a something like that, or it can have sometimes some some blobs ejected that are that are expanding, and this would be the case of uh, of the last example I showed you. And sometimes it did, but in general, the radio comes from the jet. So it's not always observed. It's just no. It's not. No, it's more complicated. I didn't want to go too much to the details of technology, but it's not always observed. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have questions on Zoom? But we have another question here. Hi, a uh, good presentation. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, the first, um, what are the main characteristic uh, to distinguish be between the binary system the system composed by a ne neutron star and a black hole? You say that yes. they are fainter, but yes, uh, it's a very good question. I... So, um, so there are ways. Um, so let's say there are ways to be sure that it is an neutron star in out when it's in outburst, because for instance, if it shows type one X ray bursts, like something like that, or it shows pulsations, we know it's an neutron star. Then, in quiet, then uh, by looking at the luminosity and by looking at the X ray variability, we can prove indirectly. Because we know that the more or less the behavior, the correlation between X-ray and radio is the same, how they behave during the outburst, because we have many data. So we can say during the outburst, okay, this looks more like an neutron star or more like a black hole. After, when the system is in quiescence, we can do uh, dynamical studies and infer if the mass is bigger than a certain threshold, then we say, okay, it's a black hole. Okay, okay. Um... Uh, in all your analysis, uh, you use a huge amount of data, uh, a really um, observational campaign in the same time. But it is possible to to make the same analysis or something similar with observations observed in different different epochs. Um, uh, so we can, so for instance, we can and uh, we can study the say spectral energy distribution and how more or less it evolves with quasi simultaneous data if you are if it depends so it depends on the time scales you are you want to you, you care about no? so if you care about something that is evolving through in days then these systems evolve on time scales of yeah 
uh, eh, it's too short, uh, too big. But it, I mean, the, the typical outbursts last like one month. Okay, so if you want, if you care about how the spectral energy distribution evolves during the outburst, then you can do it with quasi simultaneous observations. If you do care about the, this short variability and you care about the lags, then they have to be simultaneous. If you do not care about the lags, then you don't care because the, the, the main issue why we need simultaneous data is because we need to be able to measure the delay between the variability the two time series. So we need to be to be probing the delays that you want to study. Yeah, yeah, because the, in the you know, repositories, there are a lot of public data, but from different epochs. And if we want to reproduce something like that, uh, we can use, but it is going to be in different times. Yeah, I know. So that's the uh, problem. I know, I know. And that's why this thing is very complicated to do. It's not very easy. Like now, there is a community. It's uh, we are managing to get more and more beautiful campaigns, but it took a lot of time. Like when I started, uh, almost ten years ago, <laughs> uh, um, they, this was like already this data set was something that was uh, amazing, and there was nothing but than, than was more than two bands simultaneous. And now we have plenty. Okay, and the last one. Um... What are the main uh, structural components that you can measure with this uh, variability analysis? Uh, sorry? Uh, for example, uh, you can study the disk and the, um, the yet, or, or what are the, the main components of the binary system that you can uh, study or, or use to... So you can... For example, if you want to measure, I don't know, the 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 size of the yeah so for 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 example yeah so if you so f with the delay between X-ray and opt and optical infrared data this one you can give a kind of constraint to the speed of the jet because you can more or less assume where the jet is emitting and so you can kind of put a a limit to the speed um I don't have it uh on this presentation if you measure then um if you measure for instance the um, Fourier power spectrum of the uh, this is something I work I've done myself if you measure uh the infrared power spectrum you can um the, the, you, you can observe a break and this break at high frequency can be interpreted as the um a, fr a frequency at which the fluctuations are damped. And therefore, this could be, for instance, it can be interpreted as the region where the um, fluctuations are injected in the jet, because therefore they, they doesn't get as longer as those, but also the, the but this is an interpretation. Um and then and then you, you can put like by measuring with different wavelengths, you can uh, actually put a constraint on how the, but this, this requires some modeling, like uh, by measuring the delays between the different wavelengths here, you can actually um, constrain how the, so say, by, by measuring the, the breaks here, you can constrain how the jet, w w how is the structure of the jet as we go up, let's say. Okay, thanks. Questions? Thanks. Small questions. This uh, you told, guys. I understand about the reflection in general. Yes. I, I, there is reflection as well. Yes. Reflection. Yes. But uh, exists any now interpretation of such uh, phenomenon? Oh no. Maybe. For. Uh, uh, but you are talking about. Uh, this interpretation, what something forming in the jet uh, or in the corona? Huh? Yes, and this delay can exist some in our interpretation, not our reflection. Do you know something about in our interpretation of this phenomenon? So, you you have to if you so you have to have something. You uh, you observe this uh, delay between the X-ray and uh, oh, yes. data. Uh, how? Uh, interpretate how reflection uh, of a disk, but maybe exists some in our interpretation. Do you know something? Uh, this is only no, no, so for this data set. Uh, wait, uh, wait,
for this data set, we know it's reprocessing because we were, be so this system has, has shown after a certain point eclipses. So we know the orbital phase very well. Uh, after, it, so we could do, so by measuring the delay, so this, this period, this system has a period of uh, 20 hours and we, uh, and what we did is to get the simul all the bits here, X-ray and infrared as a function of time. And we measured it as a orbital phase and we modeled it with a period with a, with a system that has a period as 1858. And it matches quite well. So for these systems, we know it's the processing. The other process that can happen to, to get a infrared delay is or the jet, or, um, yeah, that's, these are the two, because if you can play with three components, which are hot inflow, uh, but the hot inflow is the other way around because it's synchrotron computerization, uh, jet and reprocessing. And these are the ones that gives you a positive response. If it's short and fast, it's usually the jet. If it's long and broad, it's usually the processing. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Then see you tomorrow at 12, 12 Ensenada at 2 p.m. Mexico City.